Hello everybody, welcome to this video, kindly sponsored by Squarespace. As regular viewers will probably be familiar with by now, they provide a platform that allows you to build your own website quickly and easily and then expand it from there, whether you want to host pictures like I do, or if you want to build a business, or just let people see something you're passionate about. I of course built my website with Squarespace sometime before they approached me with this sponsorship deal, so I was happy to recommend them. And since people seem to like the practical side of things, let's have a look at another feature. Now I've recently been consolidating my library into a single room upstairs and I discovered a very small portion of my collection was made up of duplicates. So I thought why not test out their commerce section and see if I can put one or two of these up for sale. So I went to pages, selected add a store, chose a basic layout, decided to call it the Victulas Yard because why not, and dragged it to the bottom of the main navigation menu which means it appears on the far right. I can then go into my freshly created page, delete a few of the preset templates, modify one or two of the others, or I could insert a brand new one, but let's modify the ones that are there. So edit, and then let's remove the default image, and add the correct image and a bit of flavour text. Then it's over to choosing the price, and unfortunately I don't have infinite copies of the Kaiser's Cruisers, so I have to switch that off and then set that to 1. Then realise I should probably also change the preview image. Repeat the entire exercise for the second entry, which is a book on French destroyers. Go to my new Victuilla's Yard, and there they both are. Hooray! The first time you do this, you also have to spend a few minutes setting up how you would like to be paid and your shipping rates, but since both of those <laughs> involve showing some rather obviously sensitive personal details, I'm not going to show you that element. <laughs> but it only takes a few minutes. But after that, there's now a fully functional Victuilla's Yard, which is good. I'll get a bit more of that pile uploaded over the next few weeks, and if you'd like to give something like that a go, or any other kind of website format you want, head on over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to publish it, go to squarespace.com forward slash drakinafel to save 10% off your first purchase of your website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and now on with the show. The story of Japan's last carrier class is somewhat less widely known than their more famous predecessors. Indeed, sometimes it's easy to think that the Imperial Japanese Navy's fleet carrier production stopped with Taiho, and was only followed on the large carrier scale with the conversion of Shinano. But this is far from the truth. There was another class of fleet carrier planned, with a surprising number built, and even more that technically should have been built, but they wouldn't arrive in time to help the Imperial Japanese Navy's war effort, and indeed many wouldn't arrive at all. Like the Essex class in the United States, these ships were not emergency war designs drafted up after the start of the conflict. Both types actually started design work, and in the Essex's case also started construction for some ships, before Japan and the US got involved in World War II. But it's fair to say that the designs themselves were influenced by a growing awareness that war was coming, and the numbers ordered were definitely reflective of the outbreak of conflict and the attendant expected, or actual, losses. For Japan, this fitted into the series of naval armaments programs, also known as the Circle series of plans that they drafted. For the Circle 4 plan, authorised in 1938 to start in 1939 and covering approximately six years of anticipated work, a single aircraft carrier was planned, the Taiho, along with a pair of Yamato-class battleships, the third and fourth of their type. However, later in 1938 came the US Naval Act of 1938, aka the Second Vincent Act. This called for an approximate 20% increase in the US Navy's strength above and beyond the now-defunct treaty limits. Whilst Japanese planners went back to revise a new Circle 5 program, they also prepared a series of targeted expansion programs that could be implemented sooner. First, the Temporary Naval Armament Supplement Program, which mostly boosted submarines, submarine hunters, and auxiliary forces. And then, partially as a follow-on and partially as a response to the Third Vincent Act, aka the Vincent Walsh Act, aka the Two Ocean Navy Act, which would authorise, amongst other things, the Essex class as a whole, the Imperial Japanese Navy put forward the Rapid Naval Armaments Supplement Programme and the Additional Naval Armaments Supplement Programme. The latter was mostly concerned with further strengthening the submarine fleet, 
but the former called for a new fleet carrier that would form the basis of further construction. This would be named Unryu, or Cloud Dragon. As compared to the US Navy, which was now laying down the Essexes, which were considerably larger than their immediate Yorktown-class predecessors, the Imperial Japanese Navy planned to walk back somewhat from the gold standard they'd set with the Shikakus, and instead adopted a smaller, and thus easier and quicker to build option based on the Hiryu class, the immediate predecessors to the larger Shikaku and Zuikaku. Ideally, they'd have preferred a clean slate design, but the drums of war were sounding and it would be far quicker to adapt existing plans than draft entirely new ones. Not everybody was happy about this, though. The aviation department of the Japanese Navy were concerned that, since the basic design was now almost a decade old and had been a little bit small at the time, and it had proven a bit more complicated to build than they'd anticipated, and frankly speaking, it definitely wasn't all that large now, there could be complications when it came to operating newer, larger and heavier aircraft that were potentially about to enter service. Uh, they insisted that plans for a newer and better ship should continue. But whilst work on that design would progress in the background, it was decided to continue with the development of the Unryu on the grounds that it wasn't really going to detract from any future larger vessel, which was in any case some years from keel laying, and in the interim it would be better to have additional flight decks, even if somewhat smaller than ideal, than not have any at all. This was followed by the completion of the Circle 5 plan, which called for, in its original form, in capital ship terms, a revised Yamato-class design, two Super Yamatos, and two or three new armoured flight deck supercarriers derived from the Taiho design. The Hakuryu in World of Warships is roughly based on this concept. But this latter ambition was altered to a single large armoured vessel, and to medium-sized ships, near enough certainly Unryu class or similar. But this whole plan was in turn thrown into chaos by the Battle of Midway, which of course had crippled the Japanese Navy's carrier groups via the loss of over half the existing carrier fleet strength in a single day. This would in turn lead to the revised Circle 5 plan, which eliminated the battleships altogether, as well as the big carrier, instead calling at first for five Kai Taiho, or revised Taiho design carriers, plus a total of four additional Unryu class. And soon enough, the Kai Taihos were eliminated in favour of simply extending the Unryu design run, with a total, including Unryu herself, of 16 such vessels being called for. Ship 302, Unryu, and ships 5001 through 5015 in the final option of the modified Circle 5 plan. Once this was theoretically put into effect, there would be one further revision to the plan numbers. Ship 5002 and Ship 5005 would be cancelled, with their funds, materials and slipway space being diverted to the conversion of Ship 110 into a carrier. Ship 110 being the then under construction battleship Shinano. So if you've managed to keep ahead of all that, you'll know that that leaves us with a final end total goal of 14 Unryu class carriers. So, of course, what changed between the Hiryu and Unryu designs? The first and most obvious difference was placing the island on the starboard side. Hiryu and Soryu had been built with port and starboard islands respectively, but experience had shown that the starboard alignment was preferred, this coming just in time to alter Shikaku and Zuikaku from being similarly paired, which means that since Taiho and Shinano were both one-offs, the Unryus would be the first class of Japanese Navy aircraft carriers to be designed from the ground up with only starboard side islands. Additionally, the bridge island was reduced in size somewhat, compared to Hiryu, to more closely resemble Soryu's, with three internal enclosed decks and a final open deck above. With fittings for the latest Type 21 radar and anti-aircraft rangefinders pre-built in. But the total island superstructure was bulkier than the base design, despite being slightly shorter, in part to accommodate the new radar, but also to support a number of light anti-aircraft guns, to incorporate bullet and splinter-proof armour plate, 
and additional working areas for the ship's captain, possibly an admiral, and their respective staffs. In keeping with most Imperial Japanese Navy carrier design philosophy, the funnel trunking was directed downward and away, rather than vertical, and some of this was also incorporated into the aft of the island, as opposed to being separate. The rudder of Hiryu, which had made the ship just a little bit unwieldy, was also replaced with a design adapted from Soryu, which made the ships a bit more agile, a feature that, even in 1942, was becoming readily apparent that carriers needed. The overall hull shape was only very slightly modified, and overall dimensions would remain the same, but instead of three aircraft elevators, the Unryu only featured two, the middle elevator being the one that was lost, but the remaining two were made larger to accommodate newer aircraft, and some of the total cycle rate that was lost was made up for with the new elevators being a bit faster to go up and down than the older types. The arrestor cables were also updated to deal with heavier and faster aircraft which were expected to deploy with the ship, and a separate bomb lift to bring munitions up to the flight deck was included, which would also help speed up operations as it meant that aircraft that were flight ready in all respects bar their war load could thus be brought up onto deck and then loaded with bombs or torpedoes whilst they were waiting, as opposed to having to load everything in the hangar deck before clearing them for deployment further up. The ship's design would be continually modified whilst under construction, and one of the major changes incorporated in light of experience from the Battle of Midway was the installation of a foam-based extinguisher system designed to coat the entire hangar with chemically treated flame-retardant water-based foam in the event of a fire. Other anti-fire measures included setting the aviation fuel tanks in concrete to try and prevent leakage from shock damage, removing flammable materials such as wood and lino, and where equipment incorporated these or other dangerous materials, the equipment was replaced wherever possible by versions that used inert materials. Better ventilation to remove any vaporised fuel and poisonous fumes was also installed. The foam-based extinguisher system was quite important because not only would it do a slightly better job of damping down the kind of fires you'd find in an aircraft carrier's hangar than the previous CO2 system would have done, it was also a type of fire extinguisher that the damage control crews could work through and around, as opposed to the CO2 system which required you to either have a rebreather or be very very good at holding your breath. Passive defence against the other major threat to carriers, the torpedo, was also increased with a bulked up set of anti-torpedo bulkheads. Armour, on the other hand, was significantly less than pre-war carrier designs, Having now abandoned the idea of protecting the ship generally against surface ship gunfire, it was felt that protection was only needed across most of the ship against blast and splinter effects from bombs, and so the maximum thickness of armour was 5.5 inches around the magazines, but a mere 2 inches elsewhere, including over the machinery. Due to wartime shortages, the latter protection ended up being made up of a pair of one-inch plates laminated together on some ships, which meant their effective protection was probably more in the order of about one and a half inches. Deck armour was quite thin, two inches at the thickest, and about an inch elsewhere. However, revisions to the design meant that subsequent ships would be either built or planned with different values. Of all the ships planned, we know the names, or likely names in one case, of seven. Unryu, Amagi, Katsuragi, Kasagi, Aso, Ikoma, and the final kind of known ship being either Kurama or Kaimon. Uh, those of you who understand Japanese will recognise the ship's naming convention had changed. Whilst Unryu followed the previous established Dragon and Phoenix naming convention for Japanese carriers, all the subsequent ships took up the mountain naming convention established by Japanese battle cruisers and later heavy cruisers. As it turned out, the precise combination of power plant, armour, sensor and anti-aircraft suites would render almost every ship that was actually somewhat constructed pretty much unique. But in armour terms, the above mentioned information is accurate for Unryu, Amagi and Kasagi. Whilst Katsuragi and Aso would have magazine armour that was only around 3 inches thick, whilst also being the ships that had the laminated machinery space plate. 
Ikoma and all planned ships thereafter would have a mere two inch of magazine armour with an additional one inch laminated plate attached over top, but would revert to single thickness plate for the machinery spaces. Then came the power plant. It was felt ideally to adopt the newer, higher pressure steam power plants from the Shikaku and Taiho designs, but in the end a power plant more similar to that used in Hiryu, Soryu and the Megami class was adopted, giving 152,000 shaft horsepower via four screws for a top speed of 34 knots. But even this power plant proved difficult to come by in the wartime build environment, and so Amagi and Kasagi would be fitted with a slightly heavier machinery set of the type adopted by the then under construction Ibuki class cruisers. Still further logistical issues meant that Katsuragi and Asa were forced to steal power plants from destroyers that were under construction at the time, and whilst these were higher temperature and higher pressure plants, they were also being asked to move a ship that was quite easily going to be eight to ten times the displacement of their originally intended hulls, and so even with a couple of extra boilers thrown in for good measure, the power output on these two ships dropped to 104,000 shaft horsepower. But in a wonderful illustration of just how much additional power was needed to move ships at any speed much past 28-29 knots, despite almost a third drop in power, the speed for these two ships only fell by two knots to 32 knots, which was still reasonably respectable for an aircraft carrier. For Ikoma onwards, it was planned to use the Ibuki-style machinery again, albeit with a slightly lower pressure and a simplified layout, which probably would have meant they'd need separate funnels. To compensate for this, the propellers were to have been made slightly larger. Indeed, these, and other changes we'll discuss later, made the ships from Ikoma onwards something of a subclass, variously listed in Japanese documents as Kai Unryu or Kai Kai Hiryu, i.e. improved Unryu or improved improved Hiryu, which also shows just how closely related the Hiryu and Unryu designs were, at least in the minds of the Japanese designers. The use of smaller destroyer power plants also meant that Katsuragi and Aso would displace slightly less, and once again, weights would vary considerably. As planned, Unryu would have displaced 17,150 tonnes standard, Amagi and Kasagi just under 17,500 tonnes on account of their heavier machinery, Katsuragi and Aso would drop back to about 17,250 tonnes thanks to their destroyer-based power plants, and then the Ikoma onwards would return to about 17,500 tonnes. Average loaded displacement was expected to hover around 20,000 to 20,500 tonnes, and full load somewhere around 22,000 tonnes, plus or minus a few hundred tonnes, depending on the ship. However, it appears that due to modifications made during construction and possibly some skipping of precise checks on the weights of what was being installed, a number of the ships were on their way to completing significantly overweight, with Kasagi listed in late 1943 as being about 900 tonnes over her design standard displacement, and Katsuragi managing to clear 20,200 tonnes just on standard displacement on final delivery in later 1945. Sensor equipment was similarly all over the place. The Unryu was supposed to have a pair of Type 21 general purpose radar sets and a single Type 13 air search radar. Amagi and Katsuragi replaced one of the Type 21s with a shorter range but higher fidelity Type 22, which could also act as a fire control set, and it's likely that the others would have varied yet again, but since radar is one of the last things that ends up being fitted to a carrier, none of the others actually received their sets. All of the ships would receive three sets of hydrophones and a Type 3 active sonar, although again the make and model of the hydrophones varied from ship to ship. The one blessed part of consistency in all this was the heavier part of the active defences. Every ship would have a dozen 127mm or 5-inch dual-purpose guns mounted in six twin mounts, two pairs forward and one aft on either side which was the same as the Hiryu layout. Based largely on the principle of well, throw enough at the wall and some will stick, the number of Type 96 25mm guns was increased constantly. Upon completion, 
Unryu is reported to have had 13 triple and 39 single mounts, Amagi 21 triple and 63 single mounts, and Katsuragi 22 triple and 66 single mounts. Although it must also be noted that some sources say that this is a mistranslation and that actually they only had the triple mounts quoted with a bare handful of single 25mm guns, which is possible since the quoted single numbers with the in the larger amounts actually neatly divide by three into the triple mounting installations. Additionally, all carriers of the class are equipped with a number of 4.7-inch rocket launchers. Although superficially similar to the unrotated projectile launchers used early in the war by the British, these rockets were about two-thirds the diameter of those, and detonated on a variable timed fuse to scatter an incendiary and shrapnel-based payload similar to that used by the Type 3 anti-aircraft shells into the path of oncoming aircraft, as opposed to the small aerial mines of the British weapon. These came in the form of 28-cell box launchers, of which six were mounted per ship on Unryu and Amagi, and subsequent sh ships were reportedly supposed to have been armed with a newer, lighter and easier to use 30-cell version, but Katsuragi appears to have completed with the older 28-cell version in place. Reflecting just how desperate things were becoming, there were also depth charge rails and a small supply of depth charges provided to the carrier just in case it was forced to defend itself from submarines at a point-blank range. As originally planned, the air group was supposed to consist of 12 A6M0 fighters with three spares, 27 D3A dive bombers with three spares, and 18 B5N torpedo bombers with two spares for a total of 57 operational and eight spare aircraft. By late 1943, the operational numbers were the same, but the spares had been dropped. At uh, some point thereafter, probably early 1944, this was changed again to a hangar load of 21 A6M0s, 18 D4Y Judy dive bombers, uh, which the Japanese called Suisse, or Comet, and 21 B6N Jill torpedo bombers, which the Japanese called Tenzan, or Heavenly Mountain. This would mean 60 aircraft in the hangar, and another 9 dive bombers and 2 torpedo bombers stored in a deck park. One final revision survives from October 1944, listing the loadout for Kasagi, with 18 each of the main types, with the A6Ms replaced by A7M SAM fighters, which were called in Japanese the Repu, or Strong Wind plus three C6N Sion, or Iridescent Cloud, recon aircraft. Allied call sign Mirt, all of which would be stored in the hangar. Of course, by this point, the idea of filling any carrier with 57 aircraft, let alone them all being modern types, was fanciful at best for the Imperial Japanese Navy. The Ikomas were planned with a slightly different loadout. 17 fighters, 16 dive bombers, and 27 torpedo bombers, plus 6 recon aircraft for a fractionally reduced 56 total, along with a reduced bomb and fuel load, but none of this subclass would actually be completed. Of all the ships planned, ships 5009 through 5015 were cancelled in summer 1943, as their projected in-service dates of 1946 through 1948 were seen as being too long. In this, they joined the Kurama, or Kaimon, which was cancelled for similar reasons three months earlier. Ikoma was laid down in July 1943, but construction was halted in November 1944, and the hull then launched to clear the slipway. She was eventually scrapped post-war in 1946. Aso was laid down a month earlier in June 1943, also launched in November 1944, uh, but also had work stopped on her during that month. The hull would be hit by air raids in July 1945, as the Allies cleared up a lot of Japanese shipping that was still hiding in various harbours, and it was then scuttled, the remains being raised and scrapped in 1947. Kasagi had been laid down in April 1943, and launched in October 1944, she was a bit more complete than Aso and Ikoma, and work on her would continue until April 1945, when it too was abandoned and the near-complete ship was then scrapped in 1946. 
That left three ships that were actually completed. Working in reverse order, Katsuragi was laid down in December 1942, launched in January 1944, and completed in October of the same year. Whilst the Imperial Japanese Navy tried to assemble an air group for her, she was shuttled around a number of ports in the Inland Sea, and had extensive camouflage applied to try and blend her in with her surroundings. However, the call for aircraft to defend various islands meant that her intended air group was sent off to fight from island bases on the front line, and by March 1945 she was subjected to the first attacks by US Navy raiding aircraft, with only her anti-aircraft guns to defend her. This damage proved superficial though, and she survived the war, being patched up and then being used to bring home Japanese troops and civilians to the tune of almost 50,000 people throughout late 1945 and early 1946. She'd then be scrapped at the end of 1946, as despite being mostly in decent condition, Japan wasn't allowed to have aircraft carriers anymore. Amagi had been laid down in October 1942, launched a year later, and then commissioned in August 1944. She also shuttled around the Inland Sea and was placed in camouflage, receiving light damage in the same series of raids that dented Katsuragi in May 1945. However, her luck ran out at the end of July, when she was hit by multiple bombs and began to gradually settle. And then a follow-up raid a few days later caused even more damage, after which she rolled over to port and sank for good. She was still there in 1946, when she was partially scrapped in place when it was found almost impossible to patch all the holes, and then once the worst parts of the ship had been scrapped, the remains were refloated and then carted off for scrapping in a slightly drier environment. Unryu herself had the shortest, but the most exciting, life. She was laid down in August 1942, launched in September 1943, and commissioned in August 1944, only four days before Amagi. She'd already seen some interesting occurrences when the Yokosuka Air Corps had test-launched an Aichi B-7A Grace multi-role attack aircraft called Ryusei in Japanese, which is sometimes translated to Shooting Star, or alternatively Meteor. The name was appropriate enough in this case, because the large aircraft, which was significantly heavier, longer and wider than a D-4 white torpedo bomber, needed rockets attached to it in order to clear the deck of Unryu with a full warload. The aircraft was an oddly terrifying product of the Japanese aircraft factories. It was only a little smaller than the rather chunky Avenger, and it could carry a torpedo, it could work as a dive bomber, and it could actually outfight some models of the A6M Zero. Luckily, nature abhors a show off, and an earthquake levelled the factory before too many of them could have been built. The ship was then hurriedly prepared to counter US raids on Iwo Jima, but that operation was called off, and so she spent the rest of August and September working up in relatively safe waters. At the start of October, with both Amagi and Katsuragi also commissioned, they were officially incorporated as the 1st Carrier Division, albeit without a single aircraft between them. Then, later that month, almost all the other Japanese carriers went and got themselves sunk at the Battle of Cape Engano, distracting Halsey from Kurita's abortive attack on the US landing forces in Leyte Gulf. As with her sisters, the Air Corps that was supposed to supply the aircraft to the carriers had been diverted to land-based duties, and so the carriers Ryuho and Junyo were added to the formation, with presumably the crew asked to run around on the flight deck making little meow noises to keep up appearances. It was envisaged that the force would now be employed in a new manner. After some soul-searching, and a lot more warehouse-searching, 21 reconnaissance and 60 fighter aircraft were found and provided to the five carriers. The idea was to use the former to locate enemy targets, and the latter to escort the other element that would be included, the Shinbu attack unit, a kamikaze formation, which would then go in to destroy the targets that the recon aircraft identified, with the fighters there to make sure that they actually got there. But by mid-December, the plan had changed yet again. The kamikazes were taken off and sent on ahead to operate from land-based airfields in the Philippines, these were to be supplemented by the rocket-powered Cherry Blossom 
kamikaze aircraft dash human guided cruise missile but the bombers that were normally used to deploy them were now no longer considered to be survivable if they tried to carry their payloads to the philippines instead the missiles were to be taken there on a carrier amagi was initially selected but Unryu's crew had more sea experience, and so she was loaded up with 30 of the kamikaze missiles, a few small landing craft, 60 vehicles of various types, mostly trucks, 1,500 tons of varied ammunition, 1,500 troops, a few transport aircraft, some kamikaze power boats, and, believe it or not, in that they actually managed to find space for a small actual air group. With a small escort of destroyers, she set out to reinforce the garrison on Luzon Island, accompanied by two Matsu-class destroyers and the apparently indestructible Shigure. This was seen as a good sign, albeit the fact that Shigure had several times been the sole survivor of her unit was apparently being quietly ignored. The ship set sail on December the 17th, taking a roundabout route to avoid a few of the better-known areas where US subs often lay in wait. The weather became grimmer and grimmer, but their luck appeared to be holding. Unknown to them, they were actually skirting the edges of one of the two typhoons that Halsey had managed to sail his fleet into during the last stages of the war, and so the surface elements of the US fleet couldn't have done anything about the Japanese formation even if they'd known it was there changing course a couple of times to avoid the odd mine that was spotted floating ahead, the carrier and its escorts tried to make some sense of the noisy seas, whilst the calming water did at least allow for aircraft to be dispatched. However, somewhere up ahead was USS Redfish, a Balao-class SS-395. Signals intelligence had been passed on that told it to expect an enemy task force, and this was confirmed when she was soon attacked by a Japanese patrol aircraft, of a type that could only have come from a carrier. Dodging that assault, and then heading after the carrier whose mast they'd spotted on the horizon, Commander McGregor, the captain of the Redfish, enjoyed a brilliant stroke of luck. The Japanese formation was zigzagging to try and avoid submarines and long-range torpedo shots, but their latest turn brought them straight towards him almost perfectly aligned for a shot. Indeed, the Redfish's logs indicate that Commander McGregor had to make barely a single course change, just coast in and wait for the stars to align. At short range, he dispatched a spread of torpedoes. Unryu had actually detected the sub on its sonar and hydrophone array a couple of minutes earlier, but in that short amount of time hadn't been able to vector in either aircraft or destroyers to investigate when the noise of a point-blank torpedo launch was heard. To his credit, Captain Kaname immediately put the ship into a hard turn, and he managed to dodge almost every one of the incoming weapons. Almost. Three torpedoes went merrily sailing past the bow, but Torpedo number four struck the ship right underneath the island, possibly the single worst place for such an impact, as flooding and fire crippled two of the boiler rooms as well as one of the generator rooms, whilst the blast also set fire to some of the cargo, which, as you can probably guess from the list, was rather more flammable than usual. Steam pipes burst, and the carrier coasted to a halt completely out of power. It was crippled, but it wasn't actually in danger of sinking. The torpedo protection systems had done their job. Redfish itself was now under attack, both by the carrier's own guns, which had spotted the periscope just before the ship was hit, although that was less of a risk now that with the power out, very few of the guns could actually move, but there was also a destroyer closing rapidly aft. The sub fired its aft torpedoes, but the destroyer had anticipated the move and dodged them all. The Redfish was now left without any torpedoes in the tubes and a lot of very angry Japanese sailors nearby. Aboard Unryu, the fires were actually being put out and some of the power plant was being restarted. The burning trucks were summarily thrown over the side and the carrier actually began to get underway again. But Redfish had managed to confuse her attackers. A sub's normal approach when a destroyer showed up was to run deep. Instead, desperately reloading, the sub had stayed close to the surface, where the hunting vessel's sonar was somewhat less effective. 
Doing a quick 180, Redfish fired the first stern tube that could be reloaded, and Unryu's crew were treated to the sight of yet another incoming warhead. Despite firing any gun that could come to bear in an effort to destroy the weapon, it impacted just forward of the bridge. With the ship already listing slightly from the previous hit, this explosion tore into the ship largely above, and therefore bypassing, the torpedo protection. And suddenly a combination of aviation fuel and the carried munitions, which were nearby, were on fire. Moments later, a series of even larger explosions started as the burning liquid was flung far and wide, landed on new explosive objects, which themselves caught fire and exploded, thus spreading the problem. Soon enough, the fires had spread to the lower hangar, and the cherry blossom missiles that were stored there began to detonate. Each one carried a 2,600 pound warhead designed to cripple a carrier, and it turned out they were very effective at doing that. It just so happened the carrier that they were in the process of crippling was their own, and needless to say, after the 52,000 pounds of explosive present had detonated, uh, the other 10 missiles were stored elsewhere, for those of you who can do quick maths, and the explosion also setting off a number of other parts of the cargo, it, there was understandably not all that much left of the entire bow, and the ship began to rapidly sink, taking all but 145 of the approximately 3,000 men on board with her, roughly being split E50-50 between the crew and the passengers. This made it the single highest casualty sinking of an aircraft carrier thus far in history. Redfish faced a vicious counterattack, but although forced to dive so deep she actually hit the seabed, and then depth charged so hard that her pressure hull cracked, water flooded in from numerous leaks, the sonar was destroyed, the steering jammed, and to top it all off, a torpedo activated in its tube, she somehow conspired to survive and limp back into port, whereupon, rather understandably, she was immediately sent home for extensive repairs. Up on the surface, Shigure's steering failed, and she was forced to make for home, upon which her blessing-curse struck again. The other two destroyers continued on south, and were soon thereafter destroyed by US Navy aircraft and destroyers in what turned out to be the last US Navy versus Imperial Japanese Navy surface action of the war. Once more, Shigure lived, as the sole survivor of her entire unit. With the rapid loss of Shinano and Unryu in quick succession, the Japanese Carrier Aviation Corps was wholly abandoned by the Japanese Navy, and all the remaining pilots and aircraft were sent to operate from land bases. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.